We're talking today about the resurrection of the dead. And uh, the, one of the greatest explanations of it that we can find is there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll start by reading that whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some of them are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, and am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. And they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man, also, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ our Lord, Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it, it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. 
It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not the first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, such are they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So we're clearly talking about the resurrection of the dead, as I said. Today being Resurrection Sunday, we, we honor and, and, and remember and bring to remembrance the, the, the great sacrifice that our Lord made that, that was, was finalized in the resurrection from the dead. Now if you look there in verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Okay, So it begins with the gospel, but if somebody gives you a gospel that just involves Jesus on the cross, it's incomplete. And we're going to see that. The gospel begins with the cross, but it ends with the resurrection. Here in verse 1 it says, This gospel which I preached unto you, and also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by the which also ye are saved. And so the gospel must be preached, it must be received, and when it's received, that should be the firm foundation that you stand upon. You're not going to be shaken about. You're not going to be turned or tossed or, or, or be, be fearful or, or be concerned about specifically your salvation. Once you've received that gospel, that's where you stand. It's, it's final. It's, it's sure. By the which you are saved, it says here, if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. And many do believe, right, the story, but they never receive the gospel. And therefore, it's in vain. It's clear. It's preached, it's received, and that's where you stand when you're saved. But many don't do that. And this is why the Apostle Paul is dealing with the Corinthian church who was very carnal in their approach to spiritual life. And he says, so by what I see, I am presuming that some of you may have received this in vain. I'm not charging any of you of the such, but I'm just putting that out there, I think is what the Apostle Paul here is saying. Some of you may have believed in vain. The reality is, even in this room, among this congregation, among friends of ours, there are people that may have believed in vain. And so we keep that on the forefront whenever we're discussing things with people. How often have you been to the door and somebody gives you a thorough presentation of their own faith and their own belief and they seem to be saved but if you ask a few more questions you'll realize perhaps they have believed in vain and you'll need to clear up some things particularly eternal security is a, is a major point they don't have anything to stand on because they never received it so their faith is always going to be wavering in the fact of they're being a good person that day or not but here the apostle paul says very clearly that the gospel is this i delivered unto you first of all that which i also received so because he received it he's in a position now that he can deliver it to people how that christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and there's your gospel message 
in a nutshell. And how it's propagated is the following verses. It says, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me as one born out of due time. He says this, For I am the least of the apostles, and am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So the statement here is that he's making is that the gospel is in Christ's hands. He died according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel that I'm declaring unto you. I'm delivering it because I received of the same, and so did these that he was seen by. Cephas, the twelve, five hundred brethren. All of these now have the ability to deliver what they have received. The gospel can go forth, the death, burial, and resurrection can, because there was witnesses of these things. Now, he says that he is the least of the apostles, and that's a position of humility. Of, of men, the, uh, and the least, I believe, regarding them, those are who the gospel is made for. Somebody can't be proud and receive the gospel. And this here, you find the apostle Paul saying, I am the least of of the apostles, indicating his humility among them, because of his actions, he thought that he couldn't receive it. Now, the Bible is clear that the gospel is made for the apostle Paul, made for the least, made for even those that would kill and persecute and attack the church of God. And so I believe out there, there are some really wicked men that are still eligible to receive the gospel. Notice it says that the least of them. Now, Apostle Paul is making that statement that he was the least, indicating that he is humble. This isn't talking about how the gospel is made and accepted and able to be received by anybody. Because we know that the proud are often ones that rejected and rejected and rejected to the point where God cuts them off. God, God will love them no more, the Bible records. And so, so if they don't have that I am the least experience... In other words, they can admit they're a sinner and they can admit that they are unworthy of anything but death and hell. Then that gospel isn't available to them to be received. That, that that's a that's a key point to it. That that the proud cannot inherit this this gospel or receive it. He says this in verse ten. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace was which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. He's referring to those 500 brethren. We're not very far off the crucif crucifixion uh, and, and uh, the resurrection when the Corinthian church is being dealt with. And so, though some of them were asleep, the Bible records, many of them are still around, still preaching the gospel. And you would probably have a one or two point of reference to one of these original 500 when the salvation came to you. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, well, either it was I or it was one of these. We preached and so ye believe to this day, if ye didn't believe in vain. His humble position is, is, is wonderful because it gives him the stepping point to do great works. He understood that he was the least, not worthy of the grace of God. And he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And what you saw and what you see now are only by the grace of God. That he came to me, gave me salvation, and now I'm able to work more abundantly than they all. But even there, the Apostle Paul doesn't say, look at the great works I'm doing in Christ's name. But rather, he says, yet not I, but it's the grace of God. They're, they're again working with me and, and in me. Now, he continues on in verse 12, and it says, Now if Christ be, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, I think this came from the Sadducee influence. And this quite often happens when you come from a different religious background than biblical Christianity. The Sadducees, that old saying, they say they were sad you see because they did not believe in a resurrection, right? That's a little joke, a little way to remember that group too. They did not believe in a resurrection. Well, if you don't believe in a resurrection, you're not eligible to be saved because the gospel is death, burial, and resurrection coupled and brought together as the full fulfillment of what the scriptures recorded as your sacrifice and as your substitution for your own sins. But there was some that came out of it. And so 
even though they're saying there's no resurrection and they're mixed up in some sort of Gnostic idea of how they're saved, I think that it's clear though that there's some among them that are preaching that false thing and some of them are that group in verse 2 that has believed in vain. They believed, yes, Christ died for me. Okay, I, I understand that. I believe that. And yet they're rejecting the resurrection of the dead. They don't have that full story. So the Apostle Paul is going to deal with this in particularly. Christ was preached often about the resurrection. Now there is the trouble um, that, that came to that you'll, I think we'll find it a little bit later in our study that, that a lot of this, the ideas of the resurrection were a little bit hazy on people. And so they didn't realize it until after the fact. It says very early in John when, when Jesus started making statements about him rising from the dead, they didn't remember until after he had rose from the dead what even he was talking about way back when. So now they're preaching Christ clearly that he rose from the dead. Now there's many who are hearing, receiving, and believing, and getting saved as a result of it, and yet there's still that opposition, that that one part, that one all-important part is being removed from the gospel, and therefore it's incomplete, and therefore it saves nobody. Christ died, he was buried, he didn't end there because he rose from the dead. We can't just look to the cross and say, that's the be all and end all. That, that's where Jesus did all the works to pay for my sins. No, he had to die, be buried, go to hell for three days and three nights, but not be left there in hell. And his body not see corruption and his spirit be reunited with the three, rising again so that he could be seen of the brethren in order that all of these things would be fulfilled and the gospel would be complete and ready to do the saving transformation that it is intended to. Now, verse 13, he's going to start making parallels regarding unbelief in a resurrection. And he applies it directly to the faith that these have. And if they have a faith that is without resurrection, it's in vain. All of their religiosity is in vain because they have not believed the gospel. Verse 13, it says, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? That's clear. If, if, if the dead don't raise, then Christ isn't raised. He continues on in verse 14, and it says, And if Christ be not risen... Then is our preaching vain, and your faith is vain also. So if we're all preaching this resurrection, and it never happened, and it's not possible, then all of the preaching, all of the words of our mouth are just hot air that's being blown around. Verse 15, it says, Yea, and this is, this is the, the most risky and dangerous part of it all, is if they're preaching a false thing about Christ, it says, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead raised not. So if there is no resurrection of the dead, and now I think he's referring to it in the big picture. If the dead don't raise at all, then Christ didn't raise. Then we're lying about God. Then we're deceiving people, and we are found false witnesses of the God that we proclaim to love. You can see how pivotal the resurrection is to all this. The whole faith falls apart, according to the Apostle Paul here, if, if the dead raise not. Verse 16, it says, For if the dead raise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. So there it is. The, 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 bottom, the, you know, the bottom shelf of this all is that if, if Christ isn't raised, if the dead don't raise, you're still in your sins. You're not saved. You can't be saved if Christ never fulfilled the gospel in dying, being buried, and raising from the dead. And it gets even more dim. It says in verse 18, it says, And they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. All those people that we hope to see once again, all those, all those loved ones that have gone on before us as believing saints and died. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, our faith is in vain, and they're going to stay there, perish. They're lost. They're gone. Verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And you think about that. Think about the fact that, that we preach a risen Savior because that is where our hope is. We preach our, our Christ rose from the dead because that is the ultimate end of us all and that is our hope if we don't have the blessed hope if we don't have his glorious appearing when we're all reunited with our loved ones and caught up together with them in the clouds then of all the people you can think of in the earth of all men we are most miserable there's misery in us because our only hope in this life when things are bad and when things are hard and when things are, are just are just 
difficult for us out there. Our only hope is in the resurrection of the dead. It's in the end of it all when we finally will go to sleep in that hope that we will rise again. He says here, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now, we know that in the Bible there was others that died and rose again, right? Just think of Lazarus. Just think of in the Old Testament, prophets raising up little children. and, and that's just, So he must be talking about something different here. Because if, if Lazarus died and was raised up by Christ, then how can the statement be made that Christ is the first fruits of them that slept? This must be something different that he's, he's dealing with. I think the difference is, is that when Christ rose up again, he was raised incorruptible. When Lazarus rose from the dead, he was raised corruptible. He died again, believe it or not, okay? He, he rose from that death in a corruptible body, probably still had the same aches and pains as beforehand. I wonder sometimes if Lazarus didn't, didn't say, you know, why'd you do this to me, Lord? I, I was in heaven. I was really enjoying myself, and then you brought me back. But, but for the glory of God, he was brought back as, as a type of what was to come. And, uh, you know, just things that I think about. There's no, there's no biblical reason for Lazarus to not be happy about that. But he nevertheless rose from the dead, but then died again later on. And that's the case of all those. But here, the first fruits of them that slept is the example that we have of Christ, and this then must be something different. Verse 21, it says, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And so you see here that God, why God had to enter in. He had to come to this earth in order to be man so that he could bring in the resurrection of the dead. And this is why there is this statement that is made in verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So he basically had to come to this earth and do what Adam could not do. And what we could not do, being Adamic ourselves. We are of the flesh and therefore we will always yield corruption. We will always sin against God. Well, we always do wrong. We will always break his laws and his commandments. I tell people sometimes there's two ways to get to heaven and they're like, well, okay, what is this? I'm like, the first one is never sin even once in your whole life. Okay. And the second one, because you can't do the first is to believe on Jesus Christ. Therefore, the only way to get to heaven is to believe on Jesus Christ because you've sinned today, you'll sin tomorrow, and you've sinned throughout your whole life. So Jesus came in, though, and fulfilled that first, didn't he? He was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. There was no sin in him, and therefore he never succumbed to the faults of Adam and the flaw of Adam and the flesh of Adam. So every man in his own order, meaning there had to be an order of things, Christ the firstfruits, dying for our sins, raising from the dead, and then therefore afterwards those are Christ at his coming. He had to be the forerunner of those that slept and rose from the dead, be the first fruits of that to provide us the way. He needed to show us the way. He is the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And therefore, he was able to be the forerunner of the order of things that are appropriate. Verse 24 says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, and she shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. Now there's one to remind yourself of in days like these where the authorities and the rulers and the powers are constantly trying to impose their will upon us. One of these days, Christ is going to say, no more. He'll put him down. He'll put him down. He'll put him down. And then everything will submit to him, as it says in verse 25. For he must reign till he hath put all his enemies under his feet. Glory to God, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. In these days, death is what most people fear the most. We all fear, but Christians need not fear death. Why? Because we have that blessed hope. If we're in, stuck in a rut where we're fearing death, we're just like of all men that are miserable. We are of all men most miserable because we're losing focus of the fact that there is a resurrection after all of these things come to pass. 
Don't fear death because you have 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26 to remind yourself, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Commit that to your heart. Commit that to your memory. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So why do I fear something that God will destroy in due time? Rules and authorities and powers will be put down and then death finally shall be no more influence in this life. Verse 27 says, For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all and all. And the end goal of all this goes back to the original goal of creation, and that is that God would get glorified. He would have fellowship with his people, and he would get all of the glory. Now, this has to come in this order, as, it, as is seen. Because in Adam all die, Christ had to come and give an opportunity for all to be made alive. Then all can get on Christ's plan and program of believing, enter in, follow after him unto the end, when the kingdom is delivered up to the Father, when every other opposing rule and authority is put down, death is destroyed, and at that time, Christ will take all that he has, which is everything, and then deliver it up to the Father. And I believe that would even include us. We'd be delivered up to the Father and offered him as, as this great reward. God wants you. He wants you to be a part of his life. He gave his son so that that could be made available to you. And it says in verse 29, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead raise not at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? I think Paul here is just looking at a cultural thing that was going on. The Mormons baptize for the dead. They think that if, 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 if my uncle Joe the Mormon died, then I can go and get baptized in his stead and then he can go into the celestial kingdom and do all those sorts of things. So obviously there's no new thing under the sun that's being indicated here, that there was baptism for the dead happening. I don't think Paul's giving, giving credence to baptism of the dead. You don't find that anywhere else in scripture. He's dealing with a culture here and he's telling them, hey, if, if, if resurrection from the dead isn't a thing, then why do we have so many people that are being baptized for the dead in order that they would be resurrected? It doesn't make sense. He's going to bring it now, I believe, into a more Christian context here when he says in verse 30, And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If, if, if the dead rise not, what advantage do I have by being in jeopardy for the preaching that I'm making? If the dead rise not, what advantage is there in, in, in following after the Lord and wrestling with these beasts at Ephesus? I believe this is devils and, and false teachers. If you read about Ephesus, they just had a plethora of very powerful false teachers and false prophets and demonic workings going on there. And Paul's saying here, if after the manner of men I've done these things, what advantage is it me? If I'm doing all of these works in the flesh, what advantage is there for me? Look, I die daily. And, and in some cases, you look at the Apostle Paul's life, you see one time they beat him so bad and drug him out of the city and left him there for dead. And then the disciples had a little bit of a prayer meeting around him. Next thing you know, he's back up and he charges right back into the city. Paul's saying, if I'm doing these things, standing in jeopardy, my life at risk, and there's no resurrection, what advantage is there? Going back to verse 19, if, if in this life only I have hope, I am of all men most miserable. Because I'm doing all these things. I'm in jeopardy. I'm, I'm literally dying daily, getting beaten, mocked, spit upon, drug out of the city, getting, getting thrown into prison, getting brought before magistrates, wrestling with beasts at Ephesus and, and demonic spirits. If the dead rise not, then you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to eat and drink for tomorrow we die. I'm just going to live it up, whoop it up, do whatever it takes to just have a good time while I'm here. Because tomorrow I'm dead, I go in the earth, and there's nothing after that. Paul says in verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. In other words, there is a deception going on that wants to take away from you, I believe, 
one of the most important parts of the gospel, which is the resurrection from the dead. You can't pick one that's more important. They're complete in triunity, essentially. Go figure that. The gospel is only fulfilled if it finishes with the resurrection from the dead. So don't be deceived by these evil communications that are telling you that there is no resurrection. There is no hope of his coming. There is no raising from the dead. You have good manners. Don't let them be corrupted by that falsehood that is entering you. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Your good ways can easily be corrupted by these dumb thoughts and ideas that the world comes up with, in religious world especially. And we're at a time now where we need not be deceived. Be on guard because people are saying all sorts of things that are contrary to the scriptures, even subtly. So we need to be aware of these things. Verse 34 continues, it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of of God, I speak this to your shame. He's saying, do you know God? Well, then shame on you if you're not awaking to righteousness. If you're not getting up and getting after righteousness. If you're constantly being pressed down by your sins. Do you know God? Well, shame on you if you do not act like it. He continues talking about those doubtful disputations that entered in. And he said in verse 35, but some man will say... And of course, we have around us some man, don't we? Everybody's got some man in their life that's going to say something. I'm telling you right now, if it does not align with the scriptures, throw it out. Whatever some man comes and says to you, throw it out. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Paul's response is, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it died. A contrary statement, okay? It can't be quickened, it can't be made alive unless it dies. And we're like, okay, well, how does that make sense in the context of, of humanity and, and, and the life of a man ending and him, 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 him ceasing to exist? He must die to be raised from the dead, of course. But how does that fit into the world's paradigm that must be Logical. Well, in fact, it doesn't. But if they're wise, as God often implores us to be and encourages us to be, they would look to the examples that he's given in their creation. And yet they've missed that because the strong delusion that's currently setting in is of evolution. And so if you don't look to, if you look to the creation as just a mistake, then no wonder you think of yourself as just happenstance and random choices and, and, and events that have taken and transpired throughout time. No, God did things on purpose, and that's what he's going to say. He says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. Verse 37, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him to every seed his own body. What's he saying here? If you've ever done this, if you've ever, if you've ever planted a seed, it's a, little, it's a little grain of something, right? Now what comes from that seed isn't what appears afterwards. That seed needed to fall out of the plant. It needed to die, shrivel, dry up. You add it to the media that you would wish it to grow in. You add water, the life-giving, living water. And once that's upon it, what comes out is a body of God's choice. Chance it's an apple tree. Chance it's an orange tree. Chance it's whatever. That body is not the same as the seed that went in the ground. That's what he is saying here. Not like Lazarus who died and was raised in that same body. But this is something that dies, is put in the ground, and is raised in a completely different body that God has chosen. And who are you, some man, to say, well, how are the dead raised up? And what body do they come with it? Verse 38 says, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. I think there's going to be uniqueness. That, um, that, that, that dummy Ruckman says that everybody's going to be a 33-year-old man in heaven. Well, this Bible verse clearly indicates the opposite. Every seed that goes down is going to be given a, its own body according to what pleases God. Everyone will have a unique body. I believe here. And it continues on and says that there will be a difference between what is raised. 
Verse 39, and even as we can see in our example, that all flesh is not the same flesh. There is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the terrestrial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Just like we see all different bodies, shapes, sizes, and glories to them in our universe, in our, um, our, our neighborhood, in our, in our experience, just like that, so is the resurrection of the dead. It will be, that it says, it is sown in corruption, it is rain, raised in corruption. Completely different. The opposite, even. It is sown something that will corrupt and decay and cease to exist versus something that is incorruptible, cannot be corrupted. Verse 43, it continues in sense, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. And you can see how much you would hope in these things. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. My body is corrupting, and that's why when something dumb like falling down the stairs happens, I usually tell people I'm okay now, but we'll see how this incorruptible body feels tomorrow, right? It's breaking down so it doesn't react the same as it does. You take Caleb, he falls down that same set of stairs, he's going to be up, he won't feel it, he'll be fine. But I fall and look out, the next day it's going to hurt, right? Why? Because my body is corrupting. It is not what it was before. And so our hope that removes the misery is the fact that one day this corruptible will go down and I'll be raised incorruptible. I won't be susceptible to that same decay. Mm -hmm. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. You know, something dishonorable. Um, I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm the least of the apostles, the apostle Paul said. Oh, wretched man that I am. That dishonorable state that we're all in currently right now, as, as our minds can start reflecting on the sins of the past, even sins that we're caught in in the present, that, that dishonorable thing that is our flesh, will be raised glorious one day. It'll be sown in weakness, and, and you know what? I am very weak in so many different ways, but it'll be raised in power. It is sown a natural body, verse 44. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. In other words, a spirit that can bring life. Not just a life, but a spirit that brings life is what Christ was brought in as. Verse 46, how be it, that was not first, which is spiritual. In other words, we didn't just kick this thing off as spiritual, which indicates to me that we're not returning to a Garden of Eden endemic state with Adam and Eve, where we talk about everything being perfect and being brought back to that state. No, no, no. They were corruptible. We're looking at something greater than that, which is... What, what God currently has, what Jesus currently has. How be it that first was, um, that was not first which was spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. And so the spiritual is entering in after the fact, right? Remember how we said everything in its own order, Christ first, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. You know that they that are Christ at his coming will include Adam, right? He's going to be following after Jesus as that forerunner, for. 47. The first man is of the earth, earthy. Right? He had to be formed of the dust of the earth. Earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. He need not be formed of anything. He always was, always is, always shall be. Invincible, immortal. We can't understand that, but the statement in the scripture is that, hey, Adam was earthy and the Lord is from heaven. Okay? There's a difference being put there. There is a natural body, there is a spiritual body. These are, these are plain truths that the apostle is giving us so we can understand what the resurrection is and what it all means. Verse 48, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that is heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And that's another wonderful truth that we have. As you have borne earthy image, as you have walked in an earthy way, one day, and even you can experience a little taste of it now if you yield to the Spirit, we will bear the fullness of the image of the heavenly. We'll be different. We'll be changed. If you look down in verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, 
that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And this is why we go when we preach the gospel. Because a lot of people think that if they're just a good enough person, they can get into heaven. But the reality is, is that our flesh and our blood cannot inherit such things. Which also completely negates that whole statement that I made that there are two ways to heaven. Because that flesh and blood will never inherit the kingdom of God. Again, that's proving not just by our own sins and the fact that we fall short of the glory of God. That's proving by the very nature of what you are as an Adamic person. You will not inherit the kingdom of God because you are made of flesh and blood. And so, God needed to provide a way through Jesus that we can be changed and transformed so that we can be fit for the kingdom of God, suitable to rejoice and to receive that. Verse 51, and I love this. Behold, I show you a mystery. I'm showing you the mystery of all these things. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And when you're changed, now you are no longer flesh and blood, but you're in corruption and able to inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. We're dropping one soon, we're putting on a new one. Verse 54, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That last enemy that is destroyed, which is death, comes at the end, at that moment, twinkling of an eye at the last trump, when we're changed, raised incorruptible, suddenly new, suddenly different than we were before, suddenly able to enter into the kingdom of God, and death is fulfilled in its final state where it is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Right? Because the law indicates sin. When you break the law, that's sin, the transgression of the law. But now where is thy sting? Where is thy victory? Where is thy strength? The only reason it has none over the Christian is the fact that we've heard these words and we believe these words. Amen. We trust in the word. God's indicating to us through the Apostle Paul in very clear language, hey, there's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. That natural body can't inherit the kingdom of God, so you will be raised anew. And we can just accept that, or we can be like the others, you know, that man that says, well, how is the dead raised up? And, and what body do they come in? Doubting. Disputation entering in. No, God gives us in clear language that, hey, we will be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed at that moment, at that twinkling of an eye. Some of you will die and raised from the dirt. Some of you will still be alive to see it come. But the reality is, is that is a promise of God. And so death has no sting. Grave has no victory against those loved ones that we've put down. They won't be overcome by that because we will be raised anew. Death had a sting that was sin. And sin was brought in by the transgression of the law, and Christ overcame all of those to provide us as the to provide Himself as the forerunner that we could follow behind. His death, His burial, His resurrection is that perfect sacrifice that offers us access by faith to the glory that shall be revealed in us in a moment, in a twinkling of eye, at that last trump. All of us who were dead, all of us who are alive to see that day, shall be raised incorruptible and changed at that time. That is the resurrection of the dead. That's the true resurrection of the dead that we all need to look forward to and trust in and account for at this time. Because if you don't want to think about those things, then you might as well just continue walking like Adam and be of all men most miserable. Christians can do that. How do we do that? Because we have clear scriptures in front of us that bear record of the truth, and yet we don't bring these things to remembrance often enough. And we start to worry and fret about death and about suffering and about providing for ourselves and all of the cares of this world enter in, and then we stop focusing on the resurrection of the dead, and we start focusing on death. 
Death will be swallowed up in victory. Death hath no dominion over the believer. We shall be chained. We shall overcome those things by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Verse 57, thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Praise be all unto him that we don't have to suffer. We don't have to be miserable as the rest of the world. We don't have to worry and care and be concerned for these things. We have a greater future, and we need to share that future. Therefore, my beloved brethren, in verse 58, even as it has said, awake to righteousness and sin not. Some of these have not the knowledge of God. And, we're in, and he speaks to our own shame in these things. You have the knowledge of God, therefore don't be trapped by the ways of this world and find yourself in misery at times like these. Therefore, my beloved brethren, verse 58, be steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God just shows us the great glory of his appearing in our transformation when we shall be changed from corruptible to incorruption. We give him all the praise and thanks for giving us the victory over these things. But what should it do for us right now? What is the practical example and practical application of the scriptures showing us the resurrection of the dead? Well, it's that we need to awake to righteousness and sin not. It's that we need to be of all men, not miserable, but steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Don't relinquish from that. Don't, don't hide away from your purpose here. The purpose and end of all things is that we will be transformed and like Christ. But right now, knowing that, by faith believing that which is to come, we ought to be more steadfast than the day before. We ought to be more unmovable than years past. We, always, we ought to be abounding. That means jumping after, rolling into jumping and into and fighting for and getting after the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know, and ye know these things, your neighbor, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The whole purpose of the resurrection of the dead is to give us that fighting spirit to stand on the word of God and to always abound in the things that he wants us to do. The work, the labor, the toil, the struggle, the Christian things, the precedent has been set. People call this unprecedented times. No, the precedent has been set. What is the precedent for the believers? Continue steadfastly. Continue abounding. Continue working for God. That is our precedent. Christ went before us as the forerunner, and in the order of things, everyone in his own order, Christ as the first fruits prepared a way for us that we ought to follow after and seek after. We will be Christ at his coming, but right now, do you know what we have to do? Go about doing good. Preach the word of God. Live righteously and godly in this present evil word. Be steadfast in these things, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's not just the slogan, a cute little catchphrase you put on the back of a Hallmark card. That's a Bible gospel truth. The gospel ends with the resurrection, and the resurrection gives us hope that we don't need to waver. We don't need to struggle in faith. We don't need to be wimps hiding away. We don't need to be worried about what's going on out there. We need to worry about what's written in here. Um. Abounding, unmovable. Always steadfast in the work of the Lord. And that is where your labor is not in vain. That is where you can change the world you live in. That is where you can make a real difference in the lives of yourself, in the lives of your family, your friends, your neighborhood, your country. Is when you believe in the resurrection and take that to the streets. Telling people through the victory that we have of the Christ that grants you eternal life will change you Take that corruptible body that can get sick. Take that corruptible um, body that, that gets old and ages. Take that corruptible mind that cannot cease after sin. And he will make it anew. And he will give you that position where you can believe by faith and jump into this eternal life today and do great things for God. Steadfastly, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And that's the purpose of the resurrection of the dead. To get you fired up. Get you hopeful. Get you desiring that day which is to come. Look, the end's the same. Some will be asleeping. 
Some will not. Some will come up from the dirt. Some will not. They will see Christ when he returns. But either way, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of eye at the last trump. When that trumpet sounds, hey, we'll be changed. It's all over. Death swallowed up in victory. What are we doing today? Let's live victoriously now. Why? Because by faith, just believe that that day has come. Remember how the Old Testament saints had to look forward to a cross because God's word said that he would provide himself a lamb. They needed to believe, even though it didn't happen, that God would provide himself a lamb that would be slain from the foundation of the world. They believed that and trusted that by faith. Well, look where we stand today. We're believing and trusting by faith that Christ, as he came once, will come again. And when he does, we'll go up with him. Glory to God. We don't all know the timing. We all have different ideas of it. But no matter what, there's going to be some struggles in the meantime. There's going to be some trials, some tribulations, some persecutions in the meantime. But if we look to him, the author and finisher of our faith, and trust on him, then we won't be removed from that steadfastness. We won't be deceived into thinking that we are movable as believers. We won't be removed from abounding in the work that is before us. In fact, we'll get greater works done than what we did yesterday or the day before or the day before. On to bigger and better and greater things because of the resurrection of the dead. That's our hope. We're going to raise again one day. Thank you, Father.